Hi, and welcome to another episode of Cadence Fishing TV. It's been a while. You haven't seen us on the screen for a while. Chap has not been too great, but uh, he's come out today to film me at my local fishery, just five minutes from my house, which uh, during lockdown, that's about the only place I can go now, but uh, I've been coming here a few times over winter and uh, we've had some silvers, some skimmers, a few roach. So uh, we thought we'd come out today. Now that the sun's starting to come out, it's getting to early spring and uh, see if we can't put something together for you. Well, if you're wondering where my local venue is, it's Lakeside at Bealby. It's a caravan park and it's, uh, as I said earlier, it's very close to where I live and it's absolutely stuffed full of silvers. It's six or seven acres. It's eight, eight foot deep in most places. And uh, it's just great for fishing this time of year. Nice and quiet. Caravan is out here, because it is a caravan park as well. So we can come chill out, catch a few fish. The aim today is for me to give you some top tips on how to catch on the feeder in early spring. first uh, tip I can give to you is picking your swim. Today we're, we're on quite a big lake as I've just said and uh, I picked this peg solely because it's comfortable. We've got about 25 metres, pick a target, clip up and then uh, I'm just casting every two or three minutes to start with, get a bit of bait in there. I'm not putting too many loose offerings in the ground bait because even though it looks great today, it's still quite cold. So we don't want to risk overfeeding the fish and not catching them. So we'll probably increase that as we start to get bites later on. But um, I've had a couple of casts now and uh, we're starting to get some indication. So hopefully we'll catch you a few fish. The next bit of advice I'd like to give you is uh, about rod choice. Today I've picked two 11 foot rods. Uh, one is the uh, Cadence 11 foot feeder one and the other is the uh, Cadence 11 foot feeder two. There's quite a bit of difference between these two rods. The number one has got a really nice soft action and is absolutely perfect for skimmer fishing and for, and for casting short distances, sort of around 25, 30 metres. The uh, number two, I tend to use that for when I want to punch the feeder out a bit further. Uh, I've got them set up both today. What the, the number two is set up to, to go five yards beyond the line I'm fishing with the number one. And uh, that extra power that the number two has can punch that feeder out that bit extra and should the wind get up as well i've got that extra power in the number two to combat any wind that we should occur although it's great today it's just a slight breeze it's absolutely perfect i've got the two rods today but uh, if you find you can't afford both rods or you don't actually want to have both rods if i had to choose one for what I'm doing today, which is skimmer fishing, few decent bream and silver fishing, then I'd be going the 11 foot feeder one. Absolutely perfect for them 
shorter casts, 25 to 30 yards, as I've said. And uh, the action means when the fishing gets difficult, if you're going down to a nice light hook length, so 10 or 12, you'll never have a problem cracking off on the strike or anything like that. So the 11 foot number one would be my choice if I had to pick between the two. Both the 11 foot rods are supplied with three tips. These are carbon and they come in various test curves. You've got the one ounce, which is the softest, and then the longest. You've got the one and a half, and then the stiffer one, the two ounce. And there's, there's quite a noted difference between them. And the reason why we have the three different tips when fishing a lake like we are today, you really want to try and get away with the lightest tip possible. And uh, that is governed by the undertow. And the undertow on a lake, and it'll be the same on any still water, is governed again by the conditions. When the wind is blowing, we've not got much of one today, but when the wind is blowing strong, we tend to get the surface water being pushed with the wind, it hits the bank, the water underneath goes in the opposite direction, that's called the undertow. And some places it can be really strong, especially on shallow waters. But today we're quite fortunate that there's hardly any, if any, undertow at all. So my choice today on both the rods I'm using is the one ounce tip. It's very sensitive and particularly good for uh, shy biting fish such as the skimmers and the small roach that we're catching today. Right, let's look at real choice. I've coupled up uh, today with the CS10 4000 reel. It's loaded with four pound Maxima, a nice fine line so it enables casting quite easily and reaching the distance of yours you wanted. Nice, soft, supple line and it sinks quite easily. But uh, something I always do these days and that's fish with a leader. And uh, this has got an eight pound Maxima leader on. The reason we use the leader is so we get no crack offs on casting basically, because we're in and out every five minutes or so, and uh, it can soon put a lot of stress on your knots around where your terminal tackle is, and uh, you quite easily break off, especially when you're casting bigger feeders out like we do at the start of a session. Right, let's take a look at the uh, rig we're using today. Pretty standard sliding paternoster rig, twizzle boom, and that's attached to uh, the leader I mentioned earlier. And that leader, it's quite important how we do with that. It's uh, the length of the rod, and I bring it back. So uh, the end of the line when I'm, when I'm doing the uh, leader comes to me reel, and then I'll have two wraps around the reel. So when I go out to cast, when I wind the feeder ready to cast, there'll be about three or four turns on the reel. And that's where we get the strength from and avoiding them crack offs because we've got them turns on the reel. And, uh, and you'll have no problem cracking off or anything like that when using that. And I'm gonna show you the knot uh, in a minute. But uh, first of all, we'll just unhook my hook length there and uh, show you this in a little bit more detail. The hook length I'm using today as well, while we've got that in my hand, is 012 and uh, it's round about 50 centimetres long. So what we've got on here, if you can see it, if I hold that, we've got a twizzle boom there. And what that does, that's kicking that's kicking our hook length away from the feeder, which uh, avoids tangles. 
you might get odd one now and again, but pretty much it's tangle free that rig. So what I've got here, I don't know whether Chappie could catch that. On my main reel line there is that four pound Maxima and I've tied quite a long loop in that. And the idea behind that is we've got a knot there and we've got our leader attached there. So we've got knots in two different spots with a good gap between them. So we're not bulking the whole thing together it's quite simple, a double overhand loop, probably about two inches long. And then all I've got there, if you can see it, is a four turn water knot. Really efficient, nice neat knot, never lets me down. And uh, if you like, I'll just show you that. I'll just get my scissors out. It's really easy to tie. Some people have a bit of trouble with their leaders, so I'm going to cut that off now. Nice and carefully. Get rid of that. So, so there you go. We've got the loop. Pass the leader through the loop. And then just Four times over, one, two, three, four. If you can see, passing that back through the loop. And then just pulling that tight. A bit of saliva on that to wet it. And then that just pulls down tight. That's lovely and tight. You see the knot there. And what we do then is trim that off really tight to the knot. It will not come undone. You don't have to be worried about leaving a tag. Pull it tight, test it, and there's your knot. You can see that. All ready to go. Travels through the rings without any problem at all. And it's something I've been using for years now. Never had a problem. Here's a bonus, I've just chucked out on the number two, that bit further, and within 30 seconds the tip's gone round and I'm playing a better fish. I've got a feeling that this is a carp. But that's the beauty of the nice action of these rods. And I'm quite fortunate that uh, I've got this one on the number two. So I've got a bit more backbone into this one. The action is still progressive as you can see if Chappie's got that in his shot. 
lovely action to it, but it's definitely not a skimmer. Let's just hope we can get this one in. A proper bonus. It gone a bit quiet on the uh, shorter line. So we just went that bit further out, which is quite often the case, and you'll you'll pick up that odd better fish. In this case, yeah, I've seen it, it's a carp. Not a massive one, but then we wouldn't want a big double figure one on this, this gear. a pleasure to be playing it. Let's hope we can get it in for a look at it. There you go, lovely bonus carp. This one we're going to put straight back, we won't keep it in the game now. Right, you've seen all the uh, tackling and everything we've been using. I'll take you through the bait selection we've got for today. Our main ingredients, the ground bait. I've got a mix of two different ones. I've just got I've used half a bag of each that I've mixed up today. Both from Evolved baits. One is the Irish Gold. Skimmers absolutely love that. No fish meal content. Absolutely perfect for this time of year and for catching silvers. And the other is just a sweet fish meal black. Just that little bit of hint of a fish meal in the mix. And uh, when you mix them two together, comes out a lovely green, as you can see there which is what the skimmers seem to prefer here and quite a lot of places to be fair. Now mixed in with that, you might see the different coloured sections I've got there. And these are uh, something else from Evolve, which I use quite a lot in my bream fishing, both on the river and still waters. And that's uh, amino munches, a great additive the sink straight away, you might have seen them on previous videos that we've done. Straight out, of, straight out of the container, they'll sink straight in the water and they swell up and it gives the fish something to grub about on the floor. When you've drawn back in, it leaves something for them to, uh, to graze on. In my ground bait, I've got some uh, micro pellets, just a few mixed in with the ground bait when I originally mixed my ground bait. And into that, I add the uh, loose feed as we go along. I've got casters, dead maggots, and chop worm. And uh, I do put some hemp in now and again. I set off with hemp today, but I've, I've stopped feeding it. Uh, didn't seem to be doing any good that today. But uh, to that, I've had some pinkies, which uh, I like live pinkies when I'm fishing on still waters. Seems to get better results than dead ones for some reason for me. Whether that's because they grub about in the silt and fish get their heads down on it, I just don't know, but they seem to work well. And uh, that cap that we've caught was caught on three pinkies on the hook, so works some works quite well that way. We've got the usual dendrobenas. I've tried them on the hook today and I've tried small red worm, but uh, it's made no difference to the bites we're getting. In fact, they're slower. Uh, the bites came slower on worms, so I'm sticking now with um, maggot and pinky on the hook. So that pretty much covers our, uh, our bait for today. Hook bait, which I didn't cover, is uh, these are old maggots because of hard to get hold of at the moment and just a selection of red white and bronze and uh, I keep put, trying various combinations but it seems to me today that um, either 
double or triple pinky or uh, a red and a white seems to work quite well as well. We've had no fish on a dead maggot for some reason, which is usually a good bait for skimmers, but not today. So that covers our bait and uh, pretty much gives you every angle to try. But just keep ringing the changes. If you don't get bites, try something else and uh, you might find one will work better on one particular day than, than others. Right, so when you're filling the feeder, the way I do it is uh, we have a small parcel of uh, whatever particles we want to put in. In this case, I've got a bit of chopped worm and some dead maggots. We just put that into the feeder. You can see that's in the middle of the feeder now. And then just plug each end finger in the back there and the thumb at the front and then it's up to you how tight you squeeze the tighter you squeeze it the longer that will stay in the feeder but i tend to give it just a quite a medium squeeze like that and then we're left as you can see with a sandwich plenty of bait going in from there and that's and that's how i kick off the swim with that particular feeder and then uh, as the session goes on, once we've started to get a few bites, I'll go on to a smaller version, as you can see there. A lot less feed, and uh, quite often it'll be a case of just scooping the ground bait that has the odd maggot, pinky and worm in it. Hardly any feed goes into that. So once the fish are feeding in your peg, then I cut, tend to cut the particles out and just feed them ground bait. If you feel that uh, the fish are moving off and your bites are getting less frequent, then we'll add more particles again. Sometimes I'll go back up to a bigger feeder and maybe put three or four of the larger feeders back in to get them fish going again. So that's how we fill the feeder. So we'll Put a couple of maggots on the hook. Get that out. Size 16 B911 hook. And I'm just going to put on that a red maggot. We tip it off with a pinky and you might notice if I just hold that on there I've got the maggot hooked through the blunt end and the pinky the sharp end and that's just to avoid twisting and also it stops the maggot wrapping around the hook point quite often if you put them through the blunt end particularly they'll they'll wrap around and mask the point of the hook and that can mean missed bites. Right, let's cast out. To cast out, we like to do this in a very smooth action, all in one go. We've got probably 60 centimetres between the feeder and the tip. I have one hand at the bottom of the uh, handle and the other around the reel. And then we just swing it over our heads and then punch it out, hit the clip, drop it in the water and let the line sink. As if you'll feel when the feeder hits the bottom and what I like to do is then quickly just draw it, draw the feeder about a foot. And what that does, when your feeder hits the bottom, hits the, hits the lake bed, your hook is directly above it. It's just the nature of how, how it works. Your maggots or whatever bait you're using acts like a parachute and that will slowly drop down and can drop onto the top of your feeder, sometimes inside the feeder. So by just drawing it slightly, drawing the feeder as it hits the bottom, that will pull the feeder away and your hook bait will drop down the side of it away from the feeder. And that gives you a better bite registration and everything. And uh, I'm sure a few of you from time to time will have pulled that feeder back and seen the line has gone through the feeder and wonder how it's happened. 
Well, that's how it happens. When your feeder hits the bottom, the hook drops on top of the feeder. And if your feeder sat like that and the hook drops into the top of it, as that disperses, then your hook bait goes inside your feeder. Meaning the fish can't get at it. So there's another good tip. I've just hooked up into a nice fish now. And as you can see, on this 11 foot number one, the action is superb. I've only got an 012 hook length on and it's lovely and soft for playing these fish. Sheer pleasure to use. Nice and steady. I don't know what we've got. I'm assuming it's a bream or a good skimmer anyway. Definitely, definitely pick the right rod for this one. Fishing at these are a bit finicky today. Oh, it's coming up. It's lines wrapped around it. <laughs> that quietens them down. Might even be foul hooked. And it is, we've foul hooked it in the anal fin. But it shows fish have now moved into our peg. Now that's the sort of fish that we've come here today to catch. Right, one final tip. When you're feeder fishing, it's a patience game. So you really need to get your feeder rod set up in a position where you can see the tip quite easily, where everything is to hand and uh, you can pretty much leave the rod undisturbed. Keep your eye on it. And especially with skimmers, you're waiting, you'll get little indications, but you're waiting for proper bites and uh, holding it on your knee sometimes. As you're waiting for, for bites, you sometimes get a bit fidgety, the tip moves about and it's a bit confusing. So when we're skimmer fishing, especially, I like to set up just like we are at the moment. We've got a rod rest at the back to rest the butt of the, of the rod on, keeping everything pretty much knee high, which is where you would normally fish if you were fishing a pole or you were holding the rod in your hands, it would be rested on your knees. So I've got this set so if I get a bite, I've got my elbow on my knee, it's just quite simple, your hand will automatically go on to where the reel is and you can strike. I've got the rod pointed down at the water, we're fishing without hardly any tow, we're not on a river so I like we could keep the, the line in the water, the tip very close to the water. It's a lot easier to see bites and the line is out the wind. So everything is nice and stable. A good sturdy rod rest to hold your rod so it's not moving about. And you can see all the little bumps and nudges as fish are moving in and around your feeder. Experience will tell you which are line bites and which are proper bites. You'll get little pulls and tugs sometimes and that's just fish bumping into the line. You don't strike at them because all you'll do is spook the fish. Usually bites will be just a maybe a little bit of a vibration and then the tip will slowly pull round when they're on it. Sometimes bites are really, really finicky and one of the, that's one of the reasons for using the most sensitive tip you can get away with. And I've got the front rest, as you can see, is quite long. So what we can do, I just move the feeder every now and again, a little bit of movement, a bit like lifting your pole up, moving your, if you're waggler fishing, just moving the bait along and watch for a bite so then I can drop the rod in a position where I can just get a little bit of tension on. If I move that across, tension's all gone. So we just move it back to where we want, just a little bit of tension on and that's perfect. And that's a one ounce tip in there so when a fish pulls on that, hardly any resistance, 
it'll pick the bait up, it still carries on feeding, you'll see the tip go around. Well, we're getting near the end of the session now. And I've just got another fish on here. Probably a skimmer. We'll find out in a minute. Lovely skimmer, nice in the afternoon sun. Well, that's been a great day, I've enjoyed it. Early spring session, some nice fish there, and it just goes to show what you can get when you get out and give it a go. Thanks for watching. I had to go back. Everyone a swimmer.